Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January edition of Actor Nightcap. I'm so honored to have you here. Uh, I want to thank you first and foremost for coming because this is also an organization that is under the umbrella of Storyteller Sessions. The Storyteller Sessions is a Tuesday, Thursday meetup group on Facebook where writers and actors can come together and read scripts and give people a chance to get feedback and also just an opportunity to act. If you're not in that group on Facebook, please follow it. And then of course, there's me here, the host of Actor Nightcap, Ada Tempo Thomas. I am joined today by the lovely, the amazing, the talented, the suave and charming Alex Collins, <laughs> who is a great actor here in Atlanta. Um, and this week, we're um, this month, we're covering the materials. We started off talking about the craft of acting. We've done the mindset of acting, we talked about the body, and now it's time to talk about what it is that's gonna get you the reps you need to do the work that you want. Um, I'm gonna read Alex's bio, we're gonna jump into some questions, then he has activities he wants to do with us, and then you guys can ask some questions. So if you have questions already, you can drop them in the chat, follow along, take notes, uh, grab a drink, cheers, and welcome. Okay. Alex Collins is an 18 plus year member of SAG-AFTRA with experience in both the LA and Atlanta markets as an actor, content creator, producer of both union films and live theater, acting teacher, act audition coach, and industry consultant. That's like seven streams of income. Alex offers a, oh, five, okay. Well, I was trying to make it sound better, whatever. You can round down if you'd like. Collins offers a virtual on-camera audition technique class and a self-tape class primarily for TMFA members. Yep. TMFA uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Facebook group, Talent Managers for Actors. It's one of the largest Facebook groups for actors in the world, has about 90,000 members. Oh, that's embarrassing. I didn't know what that was. The TMFA that's members. <laughs> with the goal of making them more competitive with their self-tape auditions and with script analysis and also with character development and emotional preparation. So Alex, thank you. Welcome. Is there anything that uh, I left out of your bio that you'd like to add? You technically gave me like a page and a half worth of stuff and I made it like five sentences. So feel free <laughs> that's good. <laughs> to put something that's back right. in there. Well, that, that's what I said. I said, take whatever you want. Um, I'm also one half of the Beyond Acting team. If you mm -hmm. follow Beyond Acting on Instagram, at Beyond Acting, we help actors understand all the things that you weren't taught in acting school. We offer um, daily tips, tricks, and hacks on our Instagram stories and our page. We do a Monday newsletter mailing, mm -hmm. and we have, we have a whole platform of premium courses that are virtual and self-guided that you can invest in. And we also do a bunch of freebies right now. So if you happen to go to Beyond Acting, click the link in our bio. Our free download right now is the Actors Essential Email Templates. So if you need to know how to contact an, email, uh, an agent before you have them, if you have an agent and you're not quite sure how to communicate with them, or if you need to break up with that agent, we've got the templates for you and you can kind of style them to suit your needs so yeah i'm one half of that and then actually tomorrow at four o'clock my co-founder and partner in crime allison hazelden will be doing a chat live at four o'clock tomorrow on the beyond acting page uh she handles all of our social media and marketing and electronic press kits and all of that stuff so check that out yeah and honestly guys it really is very valuable i get that email every monday and we'll sit there and scour and open up different whatever i need to to find information i didn't even realize that actors outside of um being on set like you know you get pulled aside to do an epk should have their own i didn't i thought that was something that maybe agents or managers did but i know um your partner is currently offering a course to take that a workshop i believe so that's correct that's correct yeah yeah, so so that she'll, she'll sort of she'll be talking a little bit about that tomorrow and then mm -hmm. the live electronic press kit or EPK mm -hmm. zoom course will happen next week, the 19th. Um, so you can you can sign up and invest in that Michael's clapping I, I know Michael Anderson will be joining that next yeah. week. Uh, and if you can't make it live, it will be uh, it will live evergreen on our on our platform so you're able to come back and get access to it again and again if you're not able to actually join the live session. Yeah, so take advantage of that because it, a lot of the information is free and amazing and what is monetized is justifiably so and it's very valuable so we will give Alex a chance to plug that all over again if you missed it but absolutely absolutely take Ooh. advantage if you 
can. Alex, my next question is, and I don't know the answer to this, when did you first hmm. realize you wanted to be an actor? And how was that journey? Because I know you moved here from LA, but where did this all start? So not a lot of people know this actually. Um, I, I was born and raised in England. I don't sound like it, but uh, if you've seen my work, you probably have seen me play a British character. About 60% of the work I do is British. Um, and when I was very young, I watched a TV show and we, we only had three channels back in the day in England. This is pre-cable, pre-satellite. And I wanted to be a stuntman. And so I thought that was the most glamorous and coolest thing that could possibly happen. Um, and then that sort of gave away to wanting to be a professional soccer player as a lot of little kids in England want to be. And so, yeah, I, I pursued soccer and got to a pretty high level and I was able to play, play professionally very, very briefly. Um, so I sort of put all the acting ideas aside uh, until I was out of college. This is after college, a couple of years after college. Then I started dipping my toe back into that uh, for a few years before I moved out to Los Angeles with a friend of mine. So that was sort of the genesis when I was a little kid. Yeah, I'm sure I was third tree from the left in the Christmas nativity play. Uh, but it wasn't until high school that I actually did my first play. I was Dracula in a production of Dracula, my 10th grade year. And that sort of started it off. But then I did the sensible things and soccer got me into college. And then I had two, I, I, I graduated with two different business degrees. I was going to be sensible and do those sensible things boring. I'm intrigued, actually. I, whenever I meet people who are from abroad, um, what is that jump like from being, it sounds like in your early 20s in the UK to moving to LA? Because I imagine you needed a side hustle, you needed a permit to like to even work? Like, how was that? So, so thankfully, I, I actually came over right before high school, my family moved oh. here. Um, and we moved to a, a, a suburban Atlanta. So I stuck out like a sore thumb. And so I didn't want to stick out for the wrong reasons. And so I adopted an American accent really quickly, which in hindsight has helped me as an actor, having access to both an American accent and palate, and then English and different forms of British accents and dialects, which were, are, are very helpful. Um, so by the time I actually did get into acting on a more professional basis, I was already a, a US citizen. So I didn't have to worry about visas or anything like that. I carry a British passport and an American passport. Nice. Yeah. My, my, dog, my dog just came back from a walk. So he wants to say hi really quick. Oh, and this is my dog? also industry related. His, na his name is Gatsby. He's, a, he's an 80, 80 pound Australian Shepherd and Great Pyrenees mix. Come here, Theo. Sit. You want to say hi to everybody? Speak. Yes. No, we can't hear you. Speak. Okay, go away. Good boy. Bye bye. All right. There we go. Dog. Dog time. This is my dog. <laughs> he's I have, I, <laughs> He likes to kiss. But look how tiny uh, he is. He's so he's tiny. Yeah. Gatsby, Gatsby hasn't been like that since he was twelve weeks old. <laughs> I. We don't know. We actually got so Alana, who used to be my agent at AMT. A friend of hers watched this little guy get abandoned in a park and then they posted about it on Facebook and I was like well we're looking for a dog that's smaller than our cat so that the dog you know doesn't scare her um, within an inch yeah. of life and then this little guy showed up and he's such a sweetie pie this is Theodore that's crazy yeah this is by Theodore Ash Ashley I am I am in Atlanta still thank you for asking and Bajo you're far too kind so <laughs> the journey from LA, so you were in Atlanta, you went to LA and you came back. What was that like? That's right. So I, I started, I started my acting, professional acting career here in Atlanta, and that was pre-tax credits, hmm. right? So there, there was not a lot happening. This was pre-self tape. So this is when Dawson's Creek was the primary production in the Southeast shooting in Wilmington, North Carolina, and you'd have an audition on a Monday and you would drive seven hours to Wilmington. You would sit in the Finn Cannon's lobby and you'd get brought in for your two line waiter number four lines. And then you'd drive seven hours home. And then on a Wednesday, you would get a call back and have to go back up there on a Thursday and do the same thing all over again. So you would invest yes. tw 28 hours of driving for every small, teeny tiny little co-star opportunity that came up. So, you know, when, when, we, when we sometimes complain about the, the self-tapes, oh, so many self-tapes, or I don't, this one's so small, I don't want to do this. 
you, you don't want to wait, uh, drive 28 hours either. So, um, you know, there's a pro, pros and cons, but that, that's what started it. And then my, my buddy and I both booked the same national commercial for Chevy. And that's how we got our union eligibility. And we put some money in the bank and we, we hit the road and we moved to Los Angeles and did a number of years there. Um, and then the landscape changed, obviously, here in the Southeast and Georgia specifically. And I kind of saw the writing on the wall and made the decision to come back and take advantage of what was happening here. When the, just, just so everybody knows, when the tax subsidies were enacted in Atlanta in 2008, mm -hmm. there, were eight, there were eight franchised agencies in Atlanta. At the end of last year, there were 32. Yep. A 400% growth in franchised agencies. So extrapolate that out based on number of actors in the market and number of opportunities in the market. It's amazing. No, it's, it's grown exponentially. And I, I'm intrigued. I imagine people might have questions about which market you feel is best depending on where people at, are at in their careers. But whenever I talk to people, I grew up in LA. I don't know if most people know that. I grew up in Los Angeles, moved here in high school. So everybody moves to Georgia in high school, apparently. Um, <laughs> and in that, that's when I began acting. But I've now, I've since been asked, will you move back? But the quality of life is, is so much better here yeah. that I, I can't imagine. <laughs> like I was just, just in LA in November and I'm like, oh yeah, no, I remember, I, I remember why I like <laughs> Atlanta so much. And of course it's in Atlanta, in the perimeter, but I've gone to Connecticut, I've gone to Philly, I've gone to all kinds of places and I always end up coming back here. Um, and it's not just because it's a little bit cheaper and it's not just because of the opportunity, but I also feel like the quality of your experience is better. Um, I was just talking to a friend um, that I know from Black Lightning and the conversation was about how I feel like Atlanta actors, when we really get momentum, end up having a lot more confidence. That's not rooted in like faux arrogance because we got to tape in our living rooms and got to turn in what we had and we didn't sit in a room with 45 people who looked just like us that made us feel like a number. So by the time we start to build the momentum and get better at what we're doing, we, you know, we've had that chance in a little bit more of a vacuum, and maybe that's not the right, right word, but in a, a, we've had that opportunity in a way that is not normal, or at least wasn't until Atlanta came around. Yeah. I might be wrong, I don't know, but that's how I feel. I just saw some people post some things. Uh, major agencies. We'll circle back to those questions. I do have one more question for Alex before we pivot. Okay. And I want to ask, which is probably a good segue question, what is the, um, why is it important to be strategic in the way actors market themselves and not just like a free for all? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's a number of ways you can look at it and there's a number of buzzwords you can ascribe to certain things, but ultimately film and TV is a for-profit medium and you are representing a company every time you are hired. And so you're either going to positively represent that company or adversely represent that company. And so your social media footprint, your Twitter tirades from the last election cycle, whatever it is, right? Those things are all potentially looked at. And that doesn't mean you can't be yourself. That doesn't mean you can't put yourself out there, but it means number one, be consistent Number two, be transparent. And number three, be prepared. You know, there are consequences to certain things that you might say, right? No, I totally agree. My, I mean, no. I, I, know, I, know, I know for a fact, my, my last job that I did, you know, I was, I was brought on a TV show called Stargirl to play a superhero, a superhero that's been around for 80 years in the mm -hmm. DC comics landscape. That's a big deal. They're, they're taking a risk on casting me, right? And so I was in the middle of filming for the season and it's three in the morning and we're on location and I see number one on the call sheet sitting on a park bench with the showrunner and I walk over to them and they giggled and said, oh, we better stop talking about him. We better stop talking about him. And I said, oh, ha, 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 now, now I know. Now you got to say it. What, what are you talking about? And the showrunner said, Oh, I was just telling Breck, who plays Stargirl, I was just telling Breck that, you know, before, before I made an offer for you, I was looking on your Instagram and you said something that stuck with me in a positive way. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, you were on my Instagram? What, what did I say? And, and he said, well, basically you said, 
anytime you have an opportunity to be on set, don't be an asshole, mm. right? Be nice to the PAs, be nice to the casting assistants, be nice to like the driver taking you from base camp to set because we have a no, we have a no asshole policy on our show. And, and, and in hindsight, I can look back and go, yeah, there were no egos. Everybody was warm, everybody pitched in. That's why we were dancing together at 4 a.m. and singing happy birthday when it was somebody's birthday and things like that. And it was the most collaborative and warmest environment. And I think part of that leadership starts at the top and the showrunner set that example of being warm and inclusive. And so it trickled down. And I think also the two, two of the lead actors are people with a combined 50 years of experience. Mm. And so they, they don't tolerate diva attitudes. And they themselves, Luke Wilson and Amy Smart, are both incredibly grounded people. Um, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, people will check your social media. Mm. And I know you wanted to talk about how, depending on where you are in your career, the strategy of applying to agents, managers, even just submitting to casting directors is different. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it, it boils down into knowing realistically where you are in your career. Mm -hmm. So many actors wanna rush out and get headshots. They wanna rush out and get an agent. If it's day one, you're not ready for an agent. You don't know what skills you have as an actor yet. Great. Right, so first thing people rush out and do is go and get headshots. What, what stories are you trying to tell? What characters are you are trying to bring to life? That's why I, th I think if all of you on this chat are honest with yourself and you look at your first headshot session and maybe your second headshot session, you look how lifeless they were yes. or they look how two dimensional they were versus your headshots today, right? Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you solve that riddle? How do, you, how do you solve that Rubik's cube? Training, it all comes down to training. And, and look, you could have an MFA and not be a very good on-camera actor. Facts. Right? You know how to prepare and build a character and rehearse and block and, 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 and emote to the back of the room, but cameras are right here. So you need on-camera training. So you've got to have this whole combination of training before you make that first impression on an agent. So you, you, I would say one or two years of solid professional training to be an on-camera actor, then you can, you can go to a trusted teacher, go to a, men, go to a mentor and say, hey, what, what are the two or three types or what do I bring to the table as an actor? What characters can I play? And then you can go shoot uh, headshots that evoke the moods, the essences, the types of those, of those characters, right? And then, uh, then you can submit to an agent. So there's sort of three, three pillars in your career as an actor. There's brand new, and that doesn't mean your first day acting, but maybe you're brand new to the on-camera world. So you need a certain amount of training. Then when you've got an agent, it's what are you communicating to casting at that point? Casting is the buyer 90% of the time. And then once you have a reputation on and on and on with casting, you're going to get more and more opportunities. So then it's how do I make myself a skilled enough actor that I'm getting sent from casting to producers? Mm. Right? So it's sort of three, three tiers of your career. Because at the end of the day, we all say we're working actors, but, but really the work is the audition. The work is the audition. We're auditioning actors. The work is the, the actual work on set is the bonus. I do sometimes push against that verbiage. The way you said it is perfect, but I think there are people who, who make it sound like you need to be grateful that you're getting auditions to begin with. And sure, that's the case. But when you internalize that verbiage too much, you start to find actors who are falling on swords or being so sacrificial or don't have boundaries that are necessary when you get to a certain point because you're going, oh, okay, yeah, push call. But oh yeah, we don't need to, you, we don't need to adjust my exhibit G even though it's wrong and we don't need to because I'm just grateful to be here but at some point and I'm speaking from my personal experience I don't talk for other people but I know at some point I have to go wait no I'm valuable and yes I am an auditioning actor um, but I'm also offering something and the value that I'm offering is supposed to so just to add on to what you're saying because I totally yeah agree, but also don't lose your thing I, I, I I, take, I think context and verbiage is very important. I think there are three words that actors should eliminate from their vocabulary. Aspiring, 
Mm. There's no such thing as there's no such thing as an aspiring doctor. You're a med student. There's no such thing as an aspiring lawyer. You're in law school, right? Or you're waiting to take the bar. You're not an aspiring actor. If it, you may not have been paid for it yet, but you are not an aspiring actor. If you are if you are learning a scene and creating a character and you're suffering emotionally, right? And then the other two words I would I would eliminate from our vocabulary would be only and just. But it's it's only a student film. I just had two lines. It's just a co-star. No, sir. You know how difficult it is to get a co-star opportunity? Do you know how difficult it is to book that co-star? Do you know how difficult it is for that co-star to then you go up to network and get approved by network and come back and get hired? No, that wasn't just anything. That wasn't only anything. You tell him, Alex. Yeah. I also you said something. <laughs> you said something earlier too that I want to touch on is that it's important when you're getting headshots to be mildly if only just mildly aware of your type so that you're getting pictures that are um, that make it easy for your reps to pitch you. Where Absolutely. Do you, where do you fall in the conversation about type and pushing against type and all of that? Uh, this, is, this is where our, um, our artist's heart and our business person's brain have to have a separate conversation. Yeah, okay. What I, what I can do on camera and what I can do on stage are totally different than what I'm going to be given the opportunity to do, okay? I'm never going to be cast as the romantic lead who takes my shirt off. I like carbs way too much. I'm eating an entire bag of candy. I'm okay with that because I'm the jerk that's gonna beat that guy up. I'm the guy who's gonna punch Ryan Gosling in the face. Cool, I've got no problem with that. I know where I live, but 20 years ago, I might've had the false notion no, I, I could compete with Ryan Gosling. We're the same type. No, we're not. I never have been. And, and sometimes it takes a little bit of bumping up and a little bit of resistance and a little bit of um, ego checking and a little bit of rejection and failure for you to understand that, which is why even when you have the best intentions, your first set of headshots may not be authentic to you. Whether we want something or not is irrelevant. It's other people immediately categorize us as certain things. Right, at a tempo for you, because of the length of your hair and the strength in your timber of your voice, you are automatically categorized, right? And so you can either bristle against it and maybe you might in your real life, but as an artist, you can lean into it and take advantage of it, right? Because you, you know what people are gonna buy, so then you can sell what they will buy. No, you're right. I auditioned for a lot of lawyer, FBI agent, I get cast as a woman who kisses other women a lot. And I think it's just like, I'm strong and my hair is short. And apparently yeah. that's, that's all it takes. So yeah, you're absolutely making a very good point. I, I see we're having a conversation in the chat. I hope I'm not ignoring somebody on accident. Uh, sorry, that was next one. Thanks, Profound. Did I miss something? Does somebody have a question? Okay, thank you. Sorry. So type, I think that's totally fair. When it comes to an aspiring type, is the idea then to maybe sneak in that picture, maybe get that clip film to add to your reel, or is um, it just take what you can get? And so, so this is where your relationships with casting are important. But before that, being on the same page with your reps is important, right? Having a relationship with an agent is like dating. They might be the best person in the world, but they might not be the right person for you. So when you first are having a meeting with an agent, you need to be confident enough to have the conversation. What's your preferred communication style? Do you care if I email you once a week or is it once a month? Or, because different agents want different things. Don't bother Jason Lockhart at AMT with a stupid trivial little question. He won't get back to you, right? Other agents are like, yeah, hit me up with everything. No problem. And, th and there's no one style is better than the other. It's what fits for your personality type and their personally personality type to make the right marriage. Mm -hmm. Then as the relationship grows, ideally you're on the same page in the types that you're right for, okay? And as you can, as you turn in audition tapes, they should be watching them and seeing them and seeing your growth as an artist. Mm -hmm. And casting will hopefully be requesting you specifically for certain things over time to yeah. see what you're capable of, 
right? Because they want to look good to their employer, the producer, while presenting them a diverse array of opportunities from the actors. And then if you do a great job, even if you don't book, if you do a great job again and again and again for that casting director, really laser focus on what your primary type is, maybe something will come down the pipe that's like primary type adjacent. It's just right here. Mm -hmm. And so now that casting director knows that you do good work week in and week out with every take that you do, they'll give you that opportunity right there too. Maybe it's, maybe it's open ethnicity or open age or open gender at that point. And they're like, you know what? Boom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this person this opportunity. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think, sorry, somebody asked a question. Let's hit that before I say what I'm going to say. Um, okay. Is there a way in actors access to check which headshots your agents are using to submit you with? No, unfortunately, and it's the easiest thing in the world for actors access to do, and it's been the most frustrating thing in the world. You'll notice with casting networks, your headshot is attached to every audition. So you know which one they used. Mm -hmm. But this is also on you as an actor. When, when you start out, you get a bunch of headshots, and then you get a bunch more, and then you get a bunch more. And before you know it, you got 22 headshots on actors access. Your agents are not using 22 headshots, I promise you. They're using three or four. Mm -hmm. And if each of your headshots is a very specific type, you know when you get the audition breakdown which headshot they used. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting an opportunity to play a federal agent, it's not the full bearded shot that they used because federal agents don't have beards. Undercover detectives might. Mm -hmm but a federal agent doesn't. A secret service agent looks very clean shaven. So they're gonna use the headshot that I have that's most leaning towards that, or they should be again. And that's trusting that they're on the same page and you're on the same page. Right. And that you have the right, right set of materials to empower them to do their job. And depending on who your reps are um, and what the audition is, I've actually reached out and asked like, I'm about to tape this, which headshot yeah. did you submit me for with this? Because this is so specific. I, I damn near yeah. want to put on the same exact outfit that I'm in the picture in, just so they're not yeah. confused. Because they also say this. And that's, oh, that's, really important, that's really important based on the strength of your relationship, right? Some of the larger agencies in town have 700 or 800 people on the roster. You can't call them with 100 auditions a year you get and go, hey, what, what headshot do you use? Right. <laughs> can't do that. That would, that would gum up the works. And now they're not negotiating the deal points on that booking that you just got. No, 100% correct. Um, I know you also threw out the idea of, and I don't know if you're still willing to do this, people submitting their actors access, their actors access links and maybe checking out one or two and talking about in real time what they've got going on. We can do, yeah, we can do, we can do like two or three of those. Yeah. So I'm going to roll my sleeves up, not because it's work time. It's because it's hot in here. A race to the chat. Drop your link to actors access. CJ, All right, I'll yes. look at, yeah, okay, let me, uh, I don't know if you want to share it or what have you, but I'll, I'll take a look. So what's, what's great right off the bat is I see that there's, there's seven headshots. There's not too many, um, which is good. And television is leading off right off the bat, which is great because for C, her much higher profile projects come from television. I see uh, CW, Disney Plus, and Disney Plus. That's massive. And sure, in film, there's 20th Century Fox, a pretty well-known film, but it's the only one that's really well-known. We've got, we've got, excuse me, we've got three really good TV credits right off the bat. What else I love is there's training listed as well. Training is critical. And just in the headshots themselves, there's a diversity of type in those headshots that with the exception of like one of them, they're all pretty strong overall. Um, now, the biggest area of opportunity for C is, oh, you're gonna have me. Uh, if you'd like to share. This. Yeah, let me see if I can do this. Uh, okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Okay, nice. so the biggest area of opportunity right now is in the labeling for the clips, okay? Uh, Theatrical demo reel, it doesn't tell me anything. Okay, I know that it's a voiceover demo reel there and I know that there's a dramatic monologue. Emotionally, what happens in that dramatic monologue? You wanna spoon feed the buyer, who in most cases is gonna be a casting director, 
What are they emotionally going to receive over the next 30 seconds? Because what they're what the casting directors are trying to do is A, do we want to expend one of our pre precious audition slots on this actor who we don't know? Mm. Okay, well, I've got to watch a couple things. Oh, she says this was a domestic abuse victim finally standing up to her abusive husband. Watch the clip. Ooh, that was really good. Yeah, she, she stood up to him. Great. As opposed to argument, clip, drama. Well, yeah, okay, that's an argument, but it doesn't tell me what I'm really going to experience. Why that's important now is because, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give her an audition because that character is pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the other side of the coin. Casting already knows you, they love you, you got that audition. Now you're, you've uploaded your audition, casting's watched all the tapes, and now they're choosing which five, six, or seven people are gonna go to producers. And they know this particular producer likes to see clips as well. And so they're gonna sc scan your clips. They don't have a lot of time. You gotta spoon feed it to them real quick. Um, this clip is a lot like the audition. Let's send both of those together. Does that make sense? Totally. Hopefully. Yeah. So C, you want to go in and take a look at um, some of the clips and really look at how you can relabel. I know you're waiting on a lot of stuff too. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see who else can we look at here. Uh, I'll click. I'll click at Dominique. That was the next one that came in. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Good. Good to lead off with the TV because TV. Okay. So TV is good because those are your bigger credits right now, Dominique. Um, what I would do, looking at your film section, you've got 20 plus films here. So I'm expecting when I click over to the media, this is going to be the best demo reel I've ever seen. Okay. Might not be. Might be. Might not be, right? Um, training. Awesome. I love that all that is on there. Very, very good. So now let's take a look up in the, our media bin. Photos, 17 photos, I guarantee. Here's the thing to think about with headshots. Each headshot should tell a unique and compelling story. If not, you're just wearing a different color shirt. So if, if you go back and really are honest with yourself, Dominique, are you telling 17 unique, disparate, separate stories? Probably not. You're probably telling six stories, five, six, or seven. So what you know moving forward is you can clear out some of the forest for the trees, yeah. cull this down to maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 headshots, and you're gonna get more traction with the headshots you have. Now, this becomes a lot more difficult as you increase your career and credits over time, you're gonna have more reps in different markets, and sometimes reps want different things. That's when you really have to be the CEO, and otherwise you'll end up with 30 headshots. No one ever needs 30 headshots. Okay, now we look over to the media bin here. Same thing immediately right away. There's no descriptive labeling on here. So that's gonna be your primary uh, task there. That makes sense to everybody? Um, all right, let's pick one more. Uh, Ashley was the next one in the queue. Boom, boom, boom. Go to Ashley, boom, boom, boom. Okay. so. Right off the bat here, Ashley, we're, we're not, and, and look, I don't know where you're at in your career, but right now we're not working with professional competitive level headshots, right? That first shot that it, you, you look like you're in a bar or um, like the lobby of your agent, which is cool. That's a snapshot. That's fine. But it's not a professional headshot. So what happens is, is when a casting director has 100 thumbnails on their Mac, they're going to gloss right over that. Your second picture that you have that you're using as your profile picture here in Zoom, that's actually just a snapshot, but it's, it's dramatically better than the first one you have, right? We can see your eyes. We get a sense of your jawline. We get a sense of your physique and your hair. Uh, so you want to build based on that. You probably want to look at a primary or secondary theatrical type, a primary and secondary commercial type of headshot. The good thing is, is your resume is listed pretty well. Uh, I would get rid of the writer and the director in the deadbeat first because it's redundant. We see that you're the director in the third column. And second, we don't necessarily want to hire people who are going to be difficult to work with because they're also writers and directors. Mm. This is your acting resume. It's not anything else. 
doesn't mean you can't talk about it and have conversations about it in the room when you're having a meeting, but you got to get in the, in the room first. Um, education, good, good, good. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bum. So what we need is, is in education, you need to change that to training and lead off with the stuff that's most directly relevant on camera, character analysis, uh, if there's improv, if there's Meisner, Method, Chubbuck, Stanislavski, Uta Hagen, practical aesthetics, whatever the techniques are, and then your education will go at the bottom of that. Because honestly, while it's awesome to have a theater degree, there are actors with GEDs and there are actors with PhDs. It doesn't make them good actors. Thank you, Alex. Can you, you please, can you look at my media clips? Because I think I have them labeled very well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I, I wanted to do that. Yeah, because um, I did see that on a quick on a quick one here. Uh, stable and oh, look at stable and effervescent. Share, share uh, with us. Bring, brings, bring. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm not. I'm not. Am I? My dog is being really difficult. He's confusing me now. Okay. Yes. Look at this. So that's first clip right here. Stable and effervescent Victoria brings humor and heart in asking a difficult question. I okay, know what I'm going to watch. I know what I'm going to watch. Right. Um, friend a friend of improvised <laughs> improvised dialogue we don't we don't need to see that don't tell us that bitchy witty rails into frenemy that's good come here come here you've already had treats relax uh sharp spicy professional interrogates meandering boyfriend you see that that's how you label clips mm. you want to sell exactly what's going to be seen before they ever press play so when they're done watching it they go that is exactly what I thought I was going to watch. Because the worst thing that can happen is they watch a 30 or 40 second clip and they go, what the heck did I just watch? That's not what, that's not what I thought I was going to see, right? So now they have to do more work. You want to make their job as easy as possible. I've said this a lot. You, you guys may have heard me say this before. As actors, we are a solution to a problem that casting is having. That problem is in that job. And every one of us is our own solution, as long as we come authentically to that audition. So be the solution. And part of that is in your clips. Um, somebody asked a question here. What do you do with one line clips? And just, do you have any feedback on cutting up clips in general? Uh, so so let, me, let me answer that question last about one liners. What I believe, if you have enough footage, right, across independent films, student films, big budget films, network TV, whatever it is, ideally speaking, your clip should start and end on you. It shouldn't be any confusion what, whose clip it is we're watching or whose reel we're watching. If it's an ensemble, I don't want to be like, wait, who, who's, who am I watching? So start and end on you whenever possible. I believe that a clip, I believe, and there's some, there's some disagreement around industry people here. I believe a clip should be no longer than 30 seconds. And here's why. If you can't sell me that you're right for this job in 30 seconds 60 is not going to make it any easier 90 is not going to make it any easier you could trim all the fat out of a 90 second clip and just give, just give me the just give me the meat of the clip right i don't need to know a beginning a middle and an end on the scene because no casting directors watched a 30 second clip in the middle of casting a network tv show and gone you know what I need to go watch that entire film that this person did right now. It's never happened. So give them what they need in the least amount of time possible. Trim the fat, start and end on you, give them the meat. And as it relates to the one-liners, look, unfortunately, unfortunately, when we first start booking legit top level network stuff, it is gonna be often those um, story driving co-stars those occupational unnamed co-stars barista number one bottle service girl uber driver bouncer hot guy sexy girl whatever it is right here's your latte bob and it may be the back of your head because it's the reaction that the series lead is giving the value there is you auditioned you impressed the casting director you got network approval you booked the job you didn't get fired the check cleared and it's on your resume mm -hmm. It's just gravy if you get a good usable clip for your demo reel. If not, you can still use the reaction shot. Then, the, then you, you layer that in with your meteor clips, okay? There's value in having Fox. There's value in having HBO on your demo reel versus you know, a student film, but you're the lead. No one, no one really cares about that. Hmm. Also, 
sorry about that moment. My cat pried the back door open. Uh, I don't know how, she's a magician. But that was my like, oh no, <laughs> like running through the door. Forgive me for the distraction. That's okay. The, the pets are having fun tonight. I don't know what's happening. I have a question. If you have any feedback on, or not feedback, but any words of wisdom when it comes to receiving an audition and deciding whether or not you want to turn it down. When do you feel like that's an absolute no? When do you feel like it's maybe a good idea or just just tape everything? There, there are times when certain decisions need to be made, but unless, unless you are making your entire nest egg income from acting, you probably shouldn't be turning anything down. If you still have a day job waiting tables, you probably shouldn't be turning something down. Now, if you have an issue with the content, that's a different story, but that gets back to the quality of the relationship with your reps. You need to have your absolute no discussion with them up front. Know your no, okay? If that's nudity, if it's uh, racist content, if it's abusive content, if you're going out for commercials and you're a vegetarian and you will not do Big Macs for McDonald's, fine. Your agent will not care, but don't audition for it, book it, and then turn it down on principle. That's a problem. You're yeah. gonna you're gonna annoy casting, you're gonna annoy producers, and you're gonna annoy your agent, right? So so tackle that up front. Um, but there there might be a time, and I'll give you I'll give you two examples of on the surface auditions that you might turn down. Uh, the the early uh, seasons of Ozark. There was an audition for a zero line co-star. The guy just had to look silent and menacing. And the person who booked this job went on to have a three season arc on Ozark as Nelson the Hitman. Mm. He's intertwined in the primary story, the, the second storyline of the entire show. Okay. He had a good enough resume at that point. Nah, I'm going to, that's a zero line co-star. I'm going to turn it down. That's now turned into three seasons of award-winning television. So that's that's one thing there. The other one is my friend Jessica. If you guys know Jessica Mazel on The Resident, she had a three-line audition for the pilot, unnamed co-star, Nurse. At last count, she had done 52 episodes of network television. Facts. Right? You can buy a house on 52 episodes of network television. She just did, okay? That's a big deal. Yeah. And she may have started out as an unnamed co-star. She's in season five now. She's not unnamed anymore. She's not a co-star anymore. And she's tied into the storylines. They're writing for her. They're writing love interest stories for her. Like, it's a big deal. Yeah. That's not gonna happen all the time, but it's a calculated risk. Well, it's a three-line co-star. I just came off of two episodes as a guest star. I'm not gonna do co-stars anymore. Right? Okay, may, if that's for you, maybe. But there's sort of a running joke in the Southeastern market. If you don't die, you could come back. That's it. Right? That's true. And if you, and it, and if you're, if you look at a lot of the shows that have a specific geography, The Resident always takes place in a hospital. Walking Dead every season takes place in one town or village or safe place, right? So if you're cast in that, you're probably coming back for a second, third, fifth, 10th episode. Just the way it works. It's not always gonna happen. There's plenty of co-stars that are one and done. If you're, a, if you're a patient on The Resident and you die, yeah, you're not coming back. <laughs> Unless The Resident Unless. has a spinoff that turns into The Walking Dead. The Walking Dead, there yeah, you go. There you it could go. Ha could happen, could happen. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. I know sometimes, and maybe this is a different conversation altogether, but there are times where it's not even the size, but it's the content and then explaining to my white male reps why I do not want to audition for this episode of, um, yeah. insert literally anything here, but it's just like, yeah, that's of course. not, cause it's not theater. So I do feel capable as an actor, but is it gonna be believable? Because then the conversation mm -hmm. becomes, well, if your reps and the casting director thought it could be believable, then what do you know that they don't? But sometimes yeah. like, yeah, on principle, this feels shitty. So I don't want to do this. And I think that's also a time where if I'm adding anything to this moment right now, it's to say, if you're turning stuff down, be able to stand by it. Right. Absolutely. 
Be confident yeah. in your choices and be consistent yeah. in your choices too, right? I'll, I'll give you an example. Look, I play a lot of uh, deplorable characters, jerks, a-holes, racists, you know, abusive people. And I'm okay with that as an artist. I understand how to justify that. But I don't need to play a backwoods racist sheriff in a low budget thing when I've just come off of a racist Chicago cop in Lovecraft Country on HBO. I'm at a place in my career where I don't need to say yes to this anymore because I don't need the credit, mm -hmm. right? I've got, and this one checks the box for me. This, like, it's not going to get better than HBO and Lovecraft Country for that type, that character. Mm -hmm. So, so that frees me up to say no to this one to go, go in pursuit of something else. And I can stand by my convictions and choices on that. I don't need to be another racist cop. I got it on my demo reel. Cool, right? I remember talking yeah. to somebody who said, there are three things to weigh. Is it helping your career? Is it emotionally fulfilling? Is it paying well? If it's yeah. not at least two of them, then what are we doing here? Yeah. And, and I, I, I have the same three criteria, but I, I, I get a little more specific in that, is it helping my career? Please, because sure. because that, that, that can blind us somehow. What mm -hmm. I say is, is it an industry relationship I must cultivate? Ooh. Hold on. I'm you know, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go work for Clint Eastwood again for free. So the money doesn't matter. It could be a, it could be a character I've played before, but it's Clint Eastwood. I want to go work for him again. Mm -hmm. And I may, not get an, I may not get another chance. He's 91 years old now. That's wild. Yeah. This is such a sidebar, but do you know Samuel Jackson is in his 70s? No, he's not. Google he? it. Yeah, he's like 71. That's silly. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make any sense. So moisturize, y'all. Drink your water, mind your business, because it's keeping people alive out here. That's it for real. <laughs> okay. So I feel like we had one more thing before we turn it over to just straight up audience questions. Things to cover. It says actor package for actors who are repped but aren't working steadily versus actors mm -hmm. who are repped and working a good amount. Oh yeah. I'm curious. Okay. So there's 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 an interesting little thing that I've been it's doing for me. years. And I know I know a couple of agents in town will do this. On your actor's access, you've already got your clips, you've got your demo reel, you've got your headshots. What I will do when I have a particular audition that I know I'm right for, I'll, I'll get the self-tape. And when I'm uploading the self-tape to actor's access, I'll spend 15 or 20 minutes beforehand and I will recut whatever clips I have in my repertoire that are most correct for this project. So let's say I'm doing a period piece in the 19, early 1970s. Okay, well, Richard Jewell was in the 1990s. Genius Aretha was 1967 for me. Lovecraft Country was 1955 for me. And um, what else? I've got something else in, in the 60s. So I'm gonna cut those four clips together to show that I am proficient in all manner of period piece work and wearing a wig and, and looking completely different from myself. And I'm gonna upload that with my audition. Because mm -hmm. you always hear, oh, up, upload your demo reel. Well, yeah, my demo reel is on Actors Access. I could send that too, or you could send that to the producer, but I'm sending you this clip specifically. Right, or this, 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 new, this new reel, which is one clip, but it's got mm -hmm. four clips in it. So when is that, Go ahead. That, that's the that's the bridge between sort of phase two and phase three when you're brand new you don't have the luxury of enough clips when you're just working you might have that one line co-star that's not going to compel anybody necessarily to give you an opportunity it might get you the audition right but when you go from new like newly working actor to steadily working actor and you acquire a certain amount of footage now you can use that to your advantage for a specific audition not mm -hmm. just having it on your media bin but when you need it Right. If I have a certain law enforcement uh, audition, okay, let me just let me just you know, upload my law enforcement reel. Do I need my fighting and physicality reel? Let me send that. Do I need my all British reel? Let me send that. Okay, fighting and physicality reel. But I, have, I get my I get, I get my butt kicked a lot. <laughs> I have a clip, and I actually asked my reps about this, and they're like, "Just have it." But I have a clip from Legacies where I'm speaking Yoruba for like three minutes since the West African Nigerian language. 
but it doesn't, there's nowhere in my reel where that really works. And I don't know the next time I'm going to need to speak Yoruba, but it's on the CW. It was a guest star. And I just have that. Like, what do you, what do you do with that next? Well, I mean, you, you've got the value of it on the mm -hmm. resume. First off, you've got the value of it from the relationship, presumably on the showrunner and the director that you worked with, mm -hmm. right? You're reinforcing the relationship with the casting director for that particular show, whomever that might be. No hmm. idea. Right. No idea. And then you've got the opportunity, you can have it as a separate clip mm -hmm. that just shows language skills, accent okay. skills, di dialect skills. Maybe if you've got a British one that you wanna throw in there as well, or you've got, a, you've got like a Brooklyn, New York while you're doing one, now just cobble them together and you've got three different skills in one skills clip now. Dialect real. Yeah, so you don't need, you don't need three, we don't need three minutes of that, but mm -hmm. 25, sec, 25 seconds of it and 20 seconds of a British and 30 seconds of a Brooklyn. Now you got a 90 second accent reel. That's great, thank you. I really appreciate sure. that. Okay, audience, do we have questions for Alex? He's covered all the things that I wanted to know. Um, and I very selfishly asked my questions first. So I'm happy now to moderate to see what anybody else wants to know. Hey, Alex, um, can I turn my video on? I feel weird talking behind it. Please, please do. Please, anybody, if you ask a question, anybody turn it on. Okay, hey, um, so I am interested in trying to get my UK ancestry visa, which I'm not 100% certain I qualify for. Um, Briefly, my grandfather was born in Jamaica before like the Windrush thing or whatever. And he also lived in England with my grandmother and they had a child there. My grandmother still gets social security from England. So the only thing I don't have of theirs are their, their British passports, but I don't know if they needed them at the time because Jamaica was still under British rule. Right. Anyway, I'm saying all that to say that I'm I have like all the information to, uh, to try to apply. Um, I, I don't even know what my, I mean, I guess it's also just to have, uh, to like, like just to have it. Like if I can have my, my ancestry visa and be able to work over there, I would love to, um, but yeah. So, 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 so really there's two things you want to do. The first thing is you want to, you want to reach out to the UK embassy in DC. And okay. figure it out. I, 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 uh, a grandfather clause is not enough anymore. You, one of your parents would have to be British. Uh, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think because I tried to do the same thing with Canadian so I could have a third one and then go work in Vancouver and I can't because the Commonwealth countries got rid of that like 10 or 15 years ago. So I think it has to be one of your parents. I'm not sure though. Don't quote me on that. And number two, then you have to get really strategic about, um, what's the purpose of working in Europe? Because now then you would have to get on Spotlight, which is the U UK's version of Actors Access, mm -hmm. which is a minimum of 250 a year instead of $68 a year like Actors Access. So is that gonna be worth it? Then if so, you've also got to create relationships with casting in the UK, okay? I also then went to Lambda, I should have said that too. Oh, I went to Lambda. Oh, that's good. School. That's awesome. So then you've already got relationships that you can tap into. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. But you got to think about then what's your competitive advantage? Because you're not going to get, just because you would then have a British passport, you're not going to get hired as a British actor necessarily. Right. But you could come in as, you could you could be hired as an American in that show that takes place in London, right? That's That would be my competitive advantage because I can work in the UK. But right. for me, there's just, there's so much stuff here. I'd rather laser focus. Here's when it's cool. Marvel is shooting something that shoots in Atlanta and Bulgaria or Atlanta and the UK. Hey, I've got dual citizenship. I can work in both places. I, I won't be a paperwork problem. Mm -hmm. that's, that's when it's between you and someone else, you get the nod. Cause you're, you're less, you're just less paperwork. Yeah. Less, less hassle. So ho hopefully that answers it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful. Um, yeah, and it's just encouraging to to hear when to see when other people are also doing it too. Um, so yeah, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else we got? Yeah. Turn on your camera, <coughs> unmute yourself, ask a question, and I'll add the spotlight. Hey, Alex. Oh gosh. <laughs> so um, <laughs> don't do me like that. It's been a minute. Okay. Um, it's been a so minute. Um, so finally, like in a working phase of my career, which is awesome, um, 
but the problem i wouldn't say problem what i'm running into now is that the roles that i'm getting don't come with quality footage <laughs> mm. so i'm getting like yep. one-liners um all the stuff that we've been saying I'm, i should be booking for years i'm finally like getting that stuff but it's like commercials and it's um one line co-stars that kind of stuff that don't go great on a reel like i've gotten the clips and i'm like i can't do anything with this so like mm -hmm. i guess my question is like what's really like the next step you just got to hope the resume itself is going to be good enough yeah the first union job you ever book will be the hardest one for film and tv because a decision maker has to look at a, what, what is ostensibly a blank piece of paper where no one has taken a risk on you so even if if you did black lightning and you had one line and it got cut out and you got no footage you've got cw black lightning and then you've got whoever the director or the showrunner is on there that in and of itself has value because the next job comes easier. The second booking will come easier than the first one because someone has taken a risk on you and you didn't shoot up the whole set and you didn't stink up the whole set, right? Even if you got cut out stuff, everyone in this room will get cut out of something at some point. Everyone, you are not immune, okay? I mean, Richard, Richard Jewell is a good example. I, when I booked that, I had eight scenes in the script. On the days we were shooting over these weeks, it got whittled down. Clint Eastwood cuts the script on the fly. It got whittled down to five that we shot and two and a half made it into the final scene, final film. So I went from a good supporting character two weeks with the number one on the call sheet to like a jerky sidekick for 30 seconds or a minute in this film. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Like, it's great. I have relationships. And so, uh, 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 Izzy, give me one of those one of those credits where you, you don't have usable footage. What's the name of the project? Something that we know, right? Um, it's not out yet. I don't know if I can say. <laughs> well, you, got, you got something else? Netflix, yeah. I mean, it's, I've, I've shot it already, but okay. I already know so I'm, I'm not. Netflix. By the way they shot, great. I know I'm not going to get the final cut. Great. Netflix, there's value on Netflix. They're producing great content. Uh, hopefully, I don't know if it's a film or an episodic, but hopefully you've got the director and or showrunner listed on your resume. Okay. I just have networks right now. Should I go back and do directors? I, yeah, I could not announce Lovecraft Country for over a year. So I said, NDA protected show, five episodes recurring, HBO. They... They can, they can do the math and figure out what the show is. I'm not violating the NDA, NDA right there. Okay? Yeah. If, you, if you don't want to risk anything, then, then just say NDA protected I mean, my show agent said it was fine to put the name of it on my resume, but I just haven't. Great. That's said fine. Publicly. Uh, but, but you know the moment, the moment it's on the resume or the moment it's out and you can use it, use the names too, because the next time you get sent to producers, they've worked with that person before. Everyone's worked with someone before. Mm -hmm. And look, I... I am not a talented enough actor to make a career on talent alone. So what I rely on is relationships. So if it's between me and someone else and it's down to the two of us, but that showrunner's worked with me for three months on another show two years ago, who's getting the job? Me, because I show up professional on time. I have flexible choices. I'm coachable and directable. I'm where they can find me when they need me. I don't wander off for two hours. Right, just being an adult will get you opportunities. <laughs> so there's va there's value there's value there. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Izzy. Bye, Izzy. Alex. Michael. Yes. Am I allowed to ask a question? Who who is it? Dominique. Oh, there you are. Okay, now I see you. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a quick question. Um. This is in regards to the um, talent managers page. Yeah. Um, so I've posted in there uh, multiple times for representation Sunday, trying to switch up my materials and do everything and obviously go by what is uh, required in the posts and stuff. And I, mm -hmm. um, I just haven't been getting any like feedback and trying to figure out, you know, uh, what the time to post since I'm obviously not in LA, like I'm in, you know, the Southeast too, but like, um, trying to yeah. figure out post, but I'm not getting any, any traction on it. and I've switched it up like three or four times. Um, 
and I'm just trying to figure out like if it's something that is like sticking out that I just that I don't see like as an actor or um I don't know I don't so so there's there's three things at play number one that's predominantly an, an LA industry on that page right so yeah. the southeast the southeastern reps are not on there nearly as much so your opportunities are going to be greatly diminished in that representation Sunday okay I have so a don't in Atlanta okay so that that brings me to my second and my third point I looked at your actors access right so you need to go through and do a lot of spring cleaning. You got 17 headshots. You're not telling 17 different stories. Yeah. So, uh, so, a, so an industry rep is going to look at your stuff and go, she doesn't know what she's selling. Okay. Right. So you need to, you need to go through, clear out the forest for the trees, do a lot of spring cleaning on the headshots, label the clips correctly, really present the two or three things. An agent needs to make money off of you today. Right. Two, two day. Right. And, and, and so right now, you you are not going to be competitive for an LA rep to take advantage of you. If you were just coming off a five episode arc on a Marvel show, now you got some heat behind you. Yeah. Right. So 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 that would help you, but you're and you're not in LA. No one. I I'm just coming off of a of a. I just played a superhero for an entire season, and Congrats. I have thank you, and I have an inordinate amount of challenge getting LA opportunities. Yeah, right. Because I'm because I'm not physically there, and the way COVID is right now, they don't have the time or the resources to fool with that. Right. Um. Real quick, too. My older headshots. Um. I had lost a bunch of weight, so I was keeping those on there. I guess for some crazy reason, if casting, you know, is like we want her, but we need her like heavier set. Should I? I should just take those down. Then probably. It's, if, if you were walking into that casting room today, would you bring a headshot that looks like you a year ago or a headshot that looks like you today? Today. There you yeah. go. All right. Well, thank you. You're, you're welcome. I, uh, you know, in the, in the interest of time, Dominique, I'm saying this very quickly and sharply. I don't, I don't mean any of it to be personal, right? Um, yeah. it's, ju it's just cutting through the noise so we can get you solutions. Right. No, and I respect that. Yeah. I have a lot of actors access to do so, but that's good. That helps me. I now I know something. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and look, you're not alone. Ninety percent. Hey, buddy. Ninety percent <laughs> of people. Ninety percent of people have a good amount of spring cleaning to do on their actors access. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll, I will work on that and um, get all that squared away. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you Michael ask? Anderson. Hey guys, good to see you on here. This is my first time at Nightcap and I absolutely love it. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, get a chance to talk to you guys again. Uh, real quick, my question to you, Alex. Um, one of my goals for the new year is I want to try to establish more genuine uh, connections through networking with showrunners. Uh, one of my one of the goals, like for example, one of the things that I would love to audition more frequently for is Cobra Kai, because of my background in martial arts and my ability to speak Japanese fluently. So my question to you, and I know you have worked on that in the past, but my I, I remember you had a story about how you kept a really long running kind of connection with a showrunner that ended up paying off years later. Mm -hmm. And I was just yeah. wondering if you could speak a little bit more on advice on how we can like reach out and try to establish those genuine connections. I think you touched on a really important word, Michael, genuine, genuine connections. You cannot reach out with the expectation of a result, okay? So if you're right for Cobra Kai and you love Cobra Kai, then you reach out to those guys and just tell them honestly how much you like the show. And you, you, you're not a pest. You don't do it once a week. You do it once a season, right? And they'll know once you've told them, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a you know, third degree black belt and I speak Japanese and I lived in Japan and all that stuff. And then, then your reps will also hit it from that side, right? You don't wanna be a pest. Actors, you must start to love gardening. And it sounds so stupid. You have to plant a lot of seeds. You have to tend to a lot of bushes or saplings or whatever analogy you wanna use. And you have to know that the process is enjoyable without any expectation of bearing fruit, right? And so the example that Michael is talking about 
is I started following a director, producer um, on Instagram about five years ago because he was helping to demystify what it is that a director on a TV show does. He was doing a TV show in Vancouver, a very popular uh, TV show on the CW, and no chance of me ever being on that show. Not the right show for me. And I just said, hey, look, I really appreciate you showing me uh, what a director does when they do a location scout, when they do a storyboard session, how they break an episode with the writer's room. This is so helpful. I didn't know any of this stuff, and I've been doing this 15 years, right? Five years ago, or 17 years, whatever the number was. Um, and just every three or four months, I would post a, a comment onto one of his posts and, and just say thank you or ask a question or, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I can't believe that you managed to pull that off for that show, right? Fast forward three years and I get a direct message from him who says, hey, I'm in town executive producing a show for Netflix. You'll be getting an audition next week. Huh? I didn't ask for an audition. I didn't solicit an audition. But he, he enjoyed the dialogue that we had created over a few years that he thought about me when he came to Atlanta. Like, oh, he'd be right for this. He'd be right for this guy, this chef character. We should, uh, we should give him a shot. He didn't offer me the job. I'm not there. He offered me an opportunity, right? And that's all you can ask for. So I, th I think, you know, if you come at it from an organic place, a genuine place, and then a place of just gently tending the garden every so often, that's the way to do it. Right on, I love that. Awesome, thanks, Alex. You got it, Michael. Anyone else? Kate Pre had a question. Is that oh, yay. Hi. Hello. Hi. I had a question regarding um, the commercial market here because I came from LA and didn't do any commercials. I did some classes, but I was wondering like here, the commercial market here because my agent's kind of like, there, really, there isn't much and she doesn't, and she's not gonna send me a non-union, which I'm okay with. Um, and also regarding like voiceover, like what is, I have, I kind of made my own like demo. So I have something to start with, but I, if, mm -hmm. I don't, do you have any experience with voiceover as well? So uh, I focus all of my efforts in film and TV, but what I will tell you is for voiceover, voiceover is more competitive than on camera because it's not based on what you look like, it's what you can bring to the table with your voice. So it's an endurance event. You have to have endurance in your voice. You do have to have a professional demo. So you should reach out to um, AVS, Atlanta VoiceOver Studio, Heidi and Mike. They're a husband and wife team that run that studio. And they bring in, they bring in a lot of voiceover agents. They bring in voiceover casting directors uh, and other voiceover talent who teach voiceover. They can, they can do your auditions there. They can do your callbacks there as well. And they're on the west side of Atlanta. Atlanta voiceover studio, AVS. Um, they're, yeah, they're the I, I have done two solo plays. So I've done a lot with my voice with those shows. Sure. Right, there's, there's within voiceover though, there's a, there's a very different skill set. whether you're doing commercial voice, whether you're doing character work, whether you're doing video game work or you're doing host, host work. Right. Right? right, all of those are niche, niche, and they require different subsets of training. So that would be the first stop. Commercials, you're right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's about a 65% non-union, 35% union market. Um, there's there's plenty of union commercial opportunities. They're just uh, really competitive because that's going to go out to all in the 13 southeastern states. There's over 40,000 rep actors. Right. So if you film and TV, we don't feel the heat as much. But for, for commercials, you know, take that number, then take the union actors, then take the 35 percent of the union actors who are available for that. And that become that becomes pretty competitive. Um, so I don't have any advice, unfortunately, on commercials because I, 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 I don't focus on them. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Last question. I'm on my last piece of candy. So last question. Um, so Gina had a question here. Let me pin myself so you're not alone. <laughs> um, Gina had a question. Do you recommend getting okay. a reel made if you do not have footage for one? Um, she's fairly new to the industry. And when she submits to jobs, she's not quite sure what to do when they ask for a demo reel. Mm, this is a hard one. People are getting better and better gonna, So you're you're gonna get different answers. Um the, the lovely and always transparent George, Bier, George Pierre says, if you didn't book it, I don't want to see it. 
Mm. Meaning, I know if you paid to have that made, you'll know. Other people, they want to see that you can walk and chew gum. So yeah, they would rather see that than see nothing. You have to know what works for which casting office because not it's not a one size fits all solution. What you can do if you have an agent but you don't have finished footage is you can have two or three very well shot self tapes. Stuff that you coach on, stuff that you go in and pay for at a taping facility, not in your basement, not in your guest room with the crinkled back, you know, drape with the bad lighting, like it needs to be A plus. So then when your agent is pitching you for something, they can say, we've got, a, we've got an amazing person on our roster. They're so talented. They just haven't had the opportunity to really show it yet. Look at what this person is doing class-wise. And now you're sending one or two self-tapes over to the casting director. And then perhaps the casting director can lobby on your behalf to get an opportunity for you to be seen for that. Does that make sense? There's Gina. Hi, Gina. It does. Hey. There she is, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, Cause like I said, I just, I have trouble. I usually just submit for like stuff that already has like a breakdown or like a script attached to it. And I'll just self tape it and I'll submit that. But when I'm applying to stuff that doesn't have self tapes um, sides attached to it, I don't really know what to do. So yes, that, that helps so, a lot. So when, when you're getting started, one of the best ways to get footage is in networking, right? Most classes have 10 to 12 people. That's 10 to 12 other people who are shooting a web series or a short film or their boyfriend is shooting a short film. And how, again, it's tending a garden. How can you be of service? Oh, you, you need me to be an extra on that? I'm gonna come help you. Oh, you just need, you just need a, a barista to say two lines? I'll come help you, right? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours because you'll be making a web series next year and you, you're, they're gonna wanna come help you out if, if you've helped them out, right? And so, there's however many people are in this room now, like 20, that's 19 other people to stay in contact with, 19 people to connect with in class maybe three months from now, someone you're gonna see at an audition one day when auditions go back to in-person and be like, oh, Israel, I, I re yeah, we're, we're, in, we're in the profound, we're in storyteller session. Yeah, let's do that, right? And so that's how you create these relationships over time as well, and they will pay dividends. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome, Gina. Thanks, Gina. Ashley has a question. Hey, I have another one. I actually have two, but I'm just going to keep it to the one. Um, a film that I was in last year, feature film, is going to be at a major film festival. What is the best way to leverage that? What is the best way to leverage that? Um, we're also all co-writers on the film, and I'm the title character of the film. Great. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple different ways there. It, you have to be really honest with yourself. Top tier, there's maybe five top tier festivals in the world. Then there's the next tier, which are still amazing festivals, right? And how do you, how do you utilize that to, is the film going to get a write-up? Is the film going to get press? Uh, is your performance going to get press? Are there going to be laurels all over the poster? You can use that on social media. You can use that in filmmaking groups and forums. Um, you can go to the festival and, and meet people mm -hmm. that way as well. And so if, if you are going to go to the festival, then you want to, you know, have a digital flyer whipped up really quick and a physical flyer ripped up, whipped up really quick that has screening notes. And if your screening time changes, you've got a sticker that you can put on and go, oh, it's seven o'clock on Tuesday now. Here, come see my, come see the film, come see the film. Mm. Uh, and then you, you can also, you know, if people don't want to take the physical thing, you go, whatever the Instagram handle is, just tell them that and then they can go follow you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You, um, you, you always want to think how you can make it as easy as possible for people to find your stuff. Cool. We talked about that at the beginning of the chat with clips, right? Don't, don't make me click on it to figure out what the heck I'm going to see. Tell me what I'm going to see. Tell me what I'm going to feel. And then I'll decide if whether, oh yeah, I felt that. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, and then Thanks promoting yourself. Um, and the other one that I had really quick was, um, which of your programs that you already have, do you recommend for somebody who like, I'm not a beginner, I've been doing this for a while and I have a lot of experience, but I also feel like I, I like just want to hop up to that, like I want to get to that next level. Um, either one of the programs you already have, or do you do individual like consulting to kind of look at what I have and kind of, you know, yeah. get the next steps? 
So, so if it's, if it's for the, the social media and the marketing and that sort of thing, that would be my partner at Beyond Acting. She handles all of those four programs that we have. There's four different ones at different price points and different depth of level on how deep you're going to go on stuff. Uh, the, the deepest one is marketing for the creatives 101 that will do everything all the way to the point of like give you your specific font and your brand colors that you need to use in all your collateral moving forward, that kind of thing. Um, that's, that's an important one. And then um, if, it's, if it's more just sort of on the, hey, I need somebody to do a deep dive and look at my stuff. I do do one-on-one -on -one business consultations. I'll go through your resume, your headshots, your actor's access, your demo reel and clips, and then I can answer industry questions. That's a one-hour session. And you can, you can find that on my, um, my website. And I'll just, I'll just put that in here real quick. So cool. everybody, everybody, everybody knows what that is. Yeah. Um, boom, that's, that's that right there. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're so welcome. Okay, we have time for one last question. And if not, I'm happy to gush over Alex and all the things that he has said and all of the information that he has shared, because it is one invaluable, but also it can be monetized. And this wonderful man offers consulting. Um, I will shamelessly plug the fact that I went to see Alex because at the time he did not know me very well. This was oh. 2018, maybe the end of 2018. And he mm -hmm. looked over my things and I was like, I want an objective eye. What do I need to do? We talked over, he looked thoroughly through my resume. My reel told me what I need to cut, what I should add in, looked over my actor's access, said, okay, you probably don't need this picture, change the title of this clip. And get, then this is what was really valuable for me. I don't know if I've ever told you this. He told me about other actresses who I was similar to and the trajectory of their careers and to look at roles like what they were doing and anticipate maybe being able to take that same trajectory. Because sometimes we just want to know like, how can I, what am I doing next? Or where is this going? Or is there any sort of momentum here? And being able to go, oh, okay, that is my type and that is the, um, what I can anticipate if, if only just a little bit became so helpful. Helpful to the point where probably less than four months later. And I'm not saying it's a one-to-one, -one, but I'm not, 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 not saying it's a one-to-one -one, <laughs> where I booked my first co-star finally, you know, after, cause it's, he's right. It's the hardest one to get. I booked my first co-star and I think within less than six months, I booked that arc on Black Lightning mm -hmm. because it really was just one person needed to believe. And then other people were like, okay, cool, whatever, no problem. And at that, I'd been also putting in years worth of auditioning so that, you know, Chase and Tara and Bajo and Erica Arvold and Erica Beam and George Pierre and all these people were seeing the consistency. But to have somebody like Alex who was able to look at my things and go, here, this is what you need to do. And it was very succinct, it was very honest. It was very affordable and he was very kind and also allowed me to slide into his DMs and keep asking questions um, within reason, right? Like I might need to pay for a second consult if I, can, if I keep asking <laughs> questions. But between that and the courses and the classes, and if you're not in the approach, that's an amazing Facebook group where people who are working consistently often ask questions that you may never think of and the stuff that you things like nudity writers that I'd never heard about, but this is after the I was in a bra and underwear kissing somebody on network television. And I was like, oh, I should have been able to fill that out before I was on camera, cool. So yeah. there's so much information and people like Alex are willing to share it. And I, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with us today. I know so many people have been commenting in the chat and saying thank you, and I'm very grateful as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, Haley. Yes. So, I mean, the testimonials are there. You're a lovely man. And this was phenomenal. Thanks, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, you're welcome. Oh, yeah. Please. Do you want to say any any final words? No, no. I was. I was thank, thank you for gushing. That was very kind. Haley, yeah. thank you. I see you. I see you and Patrick in here. I love that. Uh, yeah. And I, I've worked I've worked with a lot of people in town. Mm -hmm. So you can you know, if you if you just ask somebody if they know me, if you ask, you know, you throw you throw enough sticks, you'll hit somebody that's worked with me and they'll they'll give you an honest opinion whether I'm the right person to work with or not for sure. Facts. Factual. So this week and this month was about the materials. Now that we know what to do with our materials, next month is gonna be about the reps. 
I will find an agent and a manager if I have to drag my own into this, <laughs> this thing. And we will talk to them about what it takes and what they're looking for and the best way to build those relationships. Thank you everyone for tuning in for this month's Actor Nightcap. And I bid you adieu. Alex, I thank you. Audience, I thank you. Profound, I thank you. Have a lovely night. Good night, everybody.